Well, I knew nothing about mental health before I had my own lived experience. I had no interest in it and no knowledge about it. Uh, when I was 18 years old, I developed uh, what, pretty wild mood swings and they affected me till I was in my late 20s. And during that time, I was in and out of hospitals a lot. Uh, my life was um, really, you know, quite off the rails. And, um, and it was through that experience, uh, which was an incredibly difficult experience, that I, uh, not only difficult because of the internal mental state, but difficulty be because of the way others responded. And I f felt the mental health services did not know how to respond to me, and they were not interested in uh, what I had to say. Uh, they didn't ask me even if what they were doing was helping. Um, they had a very grim prognosis for me, and uh, they uh, they gave me uh, they gave me a pills and pillow service that just didn't help me. And so I thought uh, when I got out of that system that people like me who've been in that system, we have um, knowledge, we have things to offer. We have, uh, you know, and uh, we could do better. And so I came away thinking if mental health services could not respond, what are better ways of responding to people in my predicament, my type of predicament? And so really my work since then has been uh, many different ways of trying to answer that question. Yes, yeah, so I, I got out of that system, you know, in some ways it's a mystery, you don't never fully understand how you get into these states and how you get out of them, I believe that. But what I do understand is one thing that really helped me get out of that system was to not believe the story they were telling me. This was very, very important. They told me I would be affected for the rest of my life. I should think carefully about not, you know, I shouldn't work because it was stressful. Uh, I'd be on medication for the rest of my life. I should think hard about having children because I had bad genes. And um, none of that came true. And uh, it was so vital that I questioned those predictions. I would have been sunk if I hadn't questioned them. One, that's one thing. During my repeated experiences of mood swings, I learned to self-manage the experiences much better. So they were less distressing and less disruptive. Um, and another thing I, I learned uh, was to, um, now this is different from the story psychiatry gave to me, but I, uh, I developed a story of great self-pity about my life. Because, you know, I'd been in and out of hospital, my education had been interrupted, other aspects of my life had been interrupted. And I saw, for instance, um, my brother, who was two years older than me. His life was going well. He had finished his education, he had a great job, he had a partner and he had a baby. And I, I kept saying, why can't my life be like my brother's life? I feel sorry for myself. And um, what happened was that my brother was drowned crossing a river in New Zealand at the age of 28 when I was 26. And suddenly, that. Uh, it was a great tragedy, and I was in very bad grief about it because we were very close. But one thing it did for me is that it 
it, um, it smashed the story because now I was the lucky one because he was dead and I was a young woman and I might live for another 50 or 60 years. And I had a whole life ahead of me, probably. And so I had to change the story of self-pity, of bad luck into one of good luck. And I, th I think the story we tell ourselves about who we are and our, our lives is, is crucial to our recovery or the way we get on in life. And so, so changing the story was very important to me. Another thing that um, was very helpful was being able to get a job where I felt successful and made a contribution. Because I had a whole string of failures behind me. And, um, and what happened was uh, if you have good experiences in life, you build up, it's like a bank account, you build up a, a currency of good experiences. But if you go through what I went through, uh, you get into overdraft. So you just have bad experiences. And so what getting a job that I was successful at helped me to build up those good experiences. So then I went to a new place to live and I built up new relationships. And so the, the, the balance of good experiences was getting into the red again. There was, uh, I was no longer an overdraft. And, and I think that um, that's, it's a very difficult position to be in when everything in your life is just a bummer. You know, there's very little good happening. And so having the lever of a job to have a whole series of good experiences to start to happen was incredibly important. So the type of work I've been doing has been very, very varied. So I started off, uh, uh, we started up a, a peer-led support and advocacy network in New Zealand. And I stayed there for a, a couple of years, or two or three years we did that. And then I went on and uh, we established a national network that was about advocacy and providing information and resources. Um, I've been a consultant, I've worked in a funding organisation, uh, and I've also, um, uh, one of the jobs I had was as a, a a mental health commissioner in New Zealand. Now the Mental Health Commission was a, an agency set up by the government to monitor mental health services and make sure they were doing a good job and changing. Um, but I was also, I had the, was the chair of the World Network of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry. And through that role, I um, had roles with the United Nations and the World Health Organization. And since I left the Mental Health Commission, I have set up PeerZone. Uh, and uh, one of the main things that PeerZone does is we have developed peer-led workshops in mental health and addiction. We train facilitators in four different countries to uh, go out and facilitate those workshops with their peer facilitators, with the people they work with or the people in their communities who have lived experience. And so, um, and I've written a book, uh, two books, but uh, the most recent book was called Madness Made Me. And that's a memoir about my work and about, about my lived experience and also the subsequent work I've done. The issue about alternatives to, you know, traditional mainstream psychiatry uh, really, well, there's two things. It comes to, down to political will, uh, uh, and then the political will has to be translated into resources or funding. And one of the problems that we have 
Uh, now, the, I'm talking about a Western country here. One of the problems we have is that, um, so the alternatives come along, so it might be community mental health, it might be peer-led services. Um, and the, the governments do not have the courage to take away what's already there. They, so they add on little bits to what's already there. Um, and so what you have are badly resourced alternatives because most of the resources are still going into mainstream psychiatry. And this is a big problem because, you know, they have finite resources. Sometimes new money is coming in, but most often it isn't. So, so I do believe that uh, we have to, um, uh, 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 you know, approach the, ask the really difficult questions about what I call the elephant in the room, and that's, you know, the drugs, the big pharma, the institutions, um, uh, psychiatry itself, and coercion. Um, because these uh, four legs of the elephant, they take up huge resources. And as we all know, they do a lot of harm to people. Uh, so we have to persuade uh, governments that uh, we, we don't want to add on to these with meagre resources. Uh, we want to replace them. Or we want to replace large parts of them. And psychiatry should not be the hub of the wheel. Psychiatry should be one of many spokes. Well, you know, if psychiatry um, was evidence-based, it would be incredibly different to the way it is now. Um, for instance, there's no evidence base for hospital services. There's no evidence base for community treatment orders or for you know, compulsory treatment in the community. Um, but they keep doing it. So, uh, but, but, so there's this real double standard about evidence. You don't, you don't have to produce evidence for things that people have been doing uh, forever. You only have to produce evidence for new things. And, um, and so I think this is a very, double, a very unfair double standard. Oh, I think INTAR has been wonderful. And it is my first um, visit to India. And I just think it's been, um, it's been a great experience. One thing is it's very uh, nourishing because um, this is very hard work. And, um, you know, I, I personally get very despondent about the lack of progress. And I find it wonderful to be around people who are, you know, thinking about the same things and working on the same things. So that's one thing. But it's, it's great to see what's happening in Asia. Um, it's, it's fantastic. And, it, and it's great to be taken out of my uh, Western bubble because, you know, you can, you can, we, all, we, we can stay in our local bubble. And so that's been great to have some exposure to what is going on in, in other parts of the world. Uh, it's been fantastic.